Welcome to Now in the 90s, where we look at the game releases of 30 years ago today. This week, a genre-defining fighter game comes home to the consoles, an obscure RPG for the Game Boy, and some fishing. Hi, I'm your host, Jared, and today is July 15th, 1992. There are video games, and then there are cultural milestones. And sometimes those cultural milestones make it to home console. Released July 15th, 1992 for the Super Nintendo was Street Fighter II. Stay calm. Concentrate on the screen. Street Fighter II is on Super Nintendo. From the arcades, the ultimate combat game. Each fighter has a different technique, an acrobatic move, a hidden punch. It's on the streets now, exclusively on Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo with Street Fighter 2. It's unbeatable. It is impossible to overstate how important Street Fighter 2 was when it reached arcades in February 1991. It pioneered the very concept of the 1v1 fighting game with multiple playable characters of different moves and abilities with a proper two-player versus mode, the mere concept of combos. It basically revived the arcade scene to beyond the height of its popularity of the early 80s. Arcade owners had to keep buying more and more Street Fighter 2 cabinets. For well over a year, it was said it was impossible to bring to home combos because it was such a massive, impressive game. So you can imagine the absolute hype when Capcom announced a port of Street Fighter 2 for the Super Nintendo. Street Fighter 2 for the SNES was beyond impressive as it not only looked like it, it played like it and sounded like it too. This was no small feat and Street Fighter 2 was the first ever 16 megabit ROM cartridge ever produced just to make it all fit in there. Of course, a few things were changed for the home console. Most importantly, a mistranslation. Everyone remembers Ryu's infamous win quote of, you must defeat Shen Long to stand a chance, where it was supposed to say, sure you can. In the SNES game and in the instruction manual itself, it was fixed to say, you must defeat my Dragon Punch to stand a chance. The Electronic Gaming Monthly 1992 April Fools was so widespread and well known that it directly inspired the appearance of Goken, Ken and Ryu's master in Street Fighter 4. Speaking of appearances, the SNES box art is also notable. For one, it was done by artist Mark McGinty. He's also done the box art for games like Streets of Rage 2, Kid Chameleon, and like a billion Zoo Tycoon games. Now in the 90s, this isn't just great box art, this is one of the few instances where the characters on the box actually resemble how they appear in the game. May seem silly to say, but this made more people purchase Street Fighter 2 for the SNES because they had a much better idea of exactly what it was they were getting. Naturally, Street Fighter 2 went on to sell gangbusters. It's gotten so many updates, ports, and re-releases. You say you want to be a Street Fighter. You're no Street Fighter. Not until you master the six world warriors of the Street Fighter 2 handheld game. Hundred hand slaps and rolling attacks, fireballs and hurricane kicks are your weapons. Beat three in a row. Zangi, Honda, Blanca, then we'll talk. Street Fighter 2 handheld game, Doom from Tiger, batteries not included. It also spawned a wave of clones, wannabes, and true competitors. It's basically thanks to Street Fighter 2 that the competitive fighting game community even exists, leading to massive tournaments like EVO. It sold millions of units on the Super Nintendo. In the top 10 best-selling Super Nintendo games of all time, Street Fighter 2 ranks number 5, and is the best-selling third-party game for the system. I myself have a lot of fond memories of Street Fighter 2. Anytime my family went to our local Pizza Hut, I'd waste a bunch of quarters on the ride-in arcade cabinet, and then I found myself enamored with the one next to it, Street Fighter 2. Even if I was awful at it, I still rented Street Fighter 2 because I could take that Pizza Hut arcade game home. At the time, I played a lot of Dalsum because I thought the stretchy arms and legs were cool, and I couldn't even do a proper or Hadouken, which at the time I thought they were saying Ryuken because it was used by Ryu and Ken. Give me a break, man. I don't know. Kid logic. And now back to our regular schedule of obscure games I knew nothing about until we started doing research about it, like this one, Night Quest, released this week 
for the Game Boy in 1992. It's one of the better looking Game Boy games with large distinct sprites and clear animations. Gameplay has you moving around the overworld, talking to town folks and buying things, and battles move to a 2D side view. It's an RPG so you can use attacks and magic, but you have four different physical attacks to choose from. There's no difference between them other than each monster is weak to one of these attacks. Figure out which it is and you can basically one shot every single enemy you come across. Aside from the pretty cool attack animations, everything else about Night Quest is super basic. The story is as generic as it comes, it's super short at like 4 hours for an RPG, and not a whole lot of replay value. You go around, you kill stuff, you level up and buy stuff so you can go kill bigger stuff. It's basically Dragon Quest 1, but shorter and with fancier attack graphics. Even the developers knew the game was short and shallow. To help stretch out game time, the instruction manual itself tells you, just go outside and grind for a bit. Just go kill some stuff. Go ahead. Go out there. Waste some hours. In 2019, an all-new A Knight's Quest was released on all major platforms. Although, that has nothing to do with the Game Boy original, even though they share the exact same name. And that is the last we ever heard of Night Quest for the Game Boy. One of my weird childhood rentals for the NES back in the day was the fishing game, The Black Bass. This week in 1992, it got a sequel titled... The Blue Marlin. The second game in the Black Bass franchise, The Blue Marlin, is a fishing simulator. You pick a fishing destination, drive your boat out, and then reel them in. And compared to the first game, the gameplay is a drastic improvement. Now you can drive the boat to actively troll for fish, and when one bites, it switches to the reeling in mini game, where you pull it in and use the D-pad to control the line and make your guy hilariously swivel on his chair. It also has some unique mechanics, especially for a fishing game, in that you have stats that improve as you play. You can essentially level up in strength, stamina, and whatever skill does. There's even cutscene decisions where you could lose your fish. For a fishing game, it's surprisingly in-depth, especially if you compare it to the bare-bones gameplay of the original Black Bass. Fishing games are niche, but as someone who played a lot of Black Bass, I had no idea just how much better Blue Marlin is. And I'm not alone in that. Electronic Gaming Monthly reviewed it and noted that it isn't filled with intense action, but it is a surprisingly accurate fishing simulator. And I'm with them on that. I like it. The Blue Marlin would see a sequel over on the SNES with Super Black Bass and a Game Boy version, and then had many spin-offs towards the end of the 90s, with Super Black Bass Real Fight for the Game Boy Color, and then got a remake of sorts for the PlayStation 1, with the release of Black Bass slash Blue Marlin Combo Pack. The series would continue on into 2011 with Super Black Bass 3D, for the Nintendo 3DS. And the last we saw of it, when Retrobit released their Retrobit Generations Retro Home Console, included on there was the Blue Marlin. This week I counted one SNES game, one Game Boy game, and one NES game. With only three games, it's a Nintendo party this time around. Over in the collector's corner, Street Fighter 2 is a very cheap SNES game, at just under $15 for the loose cartridge and $80 for the complete version, which makes sense since it sold millions of copies. No one really cares about the Blue Marlin, so it goes for just over $20 for the cartridge and a little under $50 for complete with box and manual. Relatively cheap for an NES game. On the other hand, the biggest value gainer is easily Night Quest, which is one of the most valuable Game Boy games of all time. Just the cartridge alone is worth over $300, and with the box and manual, it's about $650. Bucks. This puts it in the top 15 most valuable Game Boy games. And that's it for today. Next week, we're looking at a D&D game, a Game Boy Racer, and a shoot 'em up from the Neo Geo with a bizarre release history. I'm Jared, and this was Now in the 90s. Thank you so much for watching Now in the 90s. Please like the video, comment down below, share it around, and subscribe if you aren't already. And if you already are a subscriber, thank you so much. Do you remember the very first character you ever played as in Street Fighter 2 and why? Like I said, I definitely played as Dalsum because I thought being able to punch from the other side of the screen was basically easy mode.